Good evening everyone, time for another Bitcoin report. This is the three minute chart of Bitcoin provided by ClarkMoody.com. This is the Mt. Gox feed. We're currently trading at $650 a Bitcoin after hitting $900 a Bitcoin just about 30 minutes ago, uh, maybe a little bit less. So. To say the least, it's been a wild ride today. As you know, we had the congressional testimony, and uh, we're going to cover that. We're going to cover part of that. We can't cover the whole thing. We're talking two plus hours of testimony. So I want to go over some highlights. But first of all, I want to look at some of the technicals in the chart pattern here. If we go to the 15 minute, you can see the signature of a top that's going to be a candlestick and you can see that we've got about a sixty dollar uh, spike on the top of that and then some major major moves down we're going to wait and see how this works itself out we probably have a lag on the Mt. Gox feed we're now down to 620 so that is taking us down below this uh, or right at this baseline support you can see there was this support established around $600. It's going to be a big test of that. And uh, it seems that a large number of Bitcoin holders have decided to take their profits in US dollars. Now, let's revisit the market depth. If you remember in the last video, I covered that, uh, the depth of how many Bitcoins there are for sale. And I believe the number was 13,000. You can see we're down to 10,000 now. So that uh, is evaporating. The Bitcoins available is uh, starting to disappear. So how does that shake out with today's market action? Uh, again, we'll just have to wait and see. But uh, there is fast and furious activity in the Bitcoin market. We've seen this before. I'm sure we're going to see it again. This very well could be a marking of the top. Now, let's get over to the congressional testimony. I'm going to start with the beginning, and uh, I'm not going to get to the Bitcoin.org or Bitcoin Foundation testimony. I'm just going to begin with the three main speakers and do some of the highlights. We had Jennifer, she's the director at FinCEN, and Mathali from the DOJ, and then Edward from the Secret Service. So let's start off with Jennifer at the 14 minute mark here. Coins to enable both the operator of Silk Road and its sellers to evade detection and launder hundreds or hundreds of millions of dollars. That being said, it is also important to put virtual currency in perspective. It has been publicly reported that Bitcoin processed transactions worth approximately $8 billion over the last year. Whereas the best estimate for the amount of criminal proceeds available for laundering throughout the financial system, at least in 2009, was $1.6 trillion. By way of comparison, in 2012, PayPal processed $145 billion in online payments. Western Union made remittances totaling $81 billion. And Bank of America made $245 trillion in wire transfers. Did you get that? So... Bitcoin is too small for the money laundering that we have. We're going to see when the DOJ person speaks uh, about their biggest bust. But the question is, is if they're cracking down on money laundering, then where is the big busts on the banks? So that's a big question that's hanging over the heads of them. Let's uh, move forward to 17 minutes. You'll have to bear with me here. It's uh, difficult to control. Stop abuses of the U.S. financial system. We have proven our willingness to do just that by using our targeted financial measures under Section 311 of the Patriot Act to name Liberty Reserve as a primary money laundering concern and entering into rulemaking to terminate its access to the U.S. financial system. We stand ready to take additional regulatory actions as necessary to stop other abuses. 
As the Financial Intelligence Unit for the United States, FinCEN must stay current on how money is being laundered in the United States so that we can share this expertise with our many law enforcement, regulatory, industry, and foreign partners. And so we've talked about this before. We know that FinCEN's mission is money laundering. Uh, FinCEN has required that Bitcoin exchanges comply with the AML, anti-money laundering statutes. But what comes out here clearly is that FinCEN has no regulatory authority whatsoever over Bitcoin. FinCEN has regulatory authority over the U.S. dollar. Uh, money laundering. Bitcoin isn't money. Therefore, transactions in Bitcoin that don't intersect with the U.S. dollar or another currency cannot be regulated by FinCEN. Now, let's go over to Mthali from the DOJ, where we get to some of the legal basis here. We have already brought several important prosecutions involving virtual currencies. And we intend to remain vigilant in ensuring that any criminal use of virtual currency systems is aggressively investigated and prosecuted. As an initial matter, I should note that virtual currency systems, so long as they comply with applicable anti-money laundering and money transmission laws and regulations, are not inherently illegal. Did you hear that? There are no laws regulating virtual currencies. There are only laws regulating money laundering. If your transaction in a virtual currency is for another virtual currency or for goods or services, they do not have any legal authority. And they can be appealing to consumers because they can provide cheap, efficient, and convenient means to transfer currency. Many of those same features, however, also make virtual currencies appealing to criminals. We have seen increasing use of such currencies by drug dealers, traffickers of child pornography, and perpetrators of large-scale fraud schemes. So I would suggest that you spend your time as the law enforcement agency prosecuting those crimes, which have nothing to do with Bitcoin. Most significantly, we have seen evidence that criminals are drawn to virtual currencies for two main reasons. First, their perception that virtual currencies offer greater anonymity than traditional financial services. And second, the irreversibility of many virtual currency transactions. Okay, so we've got two characteristics of virtual currencies. The fact that they're, they can be, they, they're not, but they can be anonymously used and the transactions are irreversible. So I would say that the same thing applies to cash. It can be anonymous and it can be irreversible. Again, uh, Bitcoin doesn't stand out any different than cash. We need to look at the crimes, not the method of transaction. Let's go and look at the DOJ's largest prosecution here. of credit card and identity fraud. At its peak, eGold reportedly moved over $6 million a day. eGold and its owners were convicted in 2008. Since that time, we have continued to ensure that we aggressively address any criminal misuse of virtual currency systems, especially as those systems evolve and develop. When vir virtual currency systems fail to live up to their obligations under existing law, we take action. Earlier this year, for example, we unsealed charges against Liberty Reserve, an offshore It looks like we've lost the feed. I'm going to try to get this back here. So I'm going to go ahead and summarize what she said here. Basically what she said is that their prosecution against Liberty Reserve was the largest money laundering prosecution in history. So the question that I would ask is, and they said it was $6 billion, if their prosecution against the, this virtual currency provider was the largest money laundering prosecution, 
again what about the 1.6 trillion dollars of money laundering that goes on every day where are those prosecutions and so we're dead on that the next one she mentioned was the Silk Road charges of course same thing uh, they actually talk about what the Silk Road operator was charged with he was charged with delivery of illegal drugs and I believe there was a charge concerning uh, like a hit or something like that or murder for hire or something like that but again the charges against the gentleman involved in Silk Road really had to do with crimes that he had committed it didn't have anything to do with the Bitcoin then our last gentleman that testified is Edward from the Secret Service he goes into cybercrime and uh, the Secret Service actually has he cited authorization that the Secret Service was given in 1984 by Congress where they enacted legislation regarding the fraudulent use of credit and debit cards uh, violations regarding credit and debit and federal interest computer fraud now if you look up the statute I did that I don't have time to go into it now but if you look up the statute you'll find that the Secret Service was tasked with investigating cybercrime in regards to break-ins into federal government computers and things like that now I don't know if that has expanded to investigation into all cyber crime it would seem to me that uh, the Secret Service and you can see the uh, beginning here the Secret Service Division was created on July 5th 1865 in Washington DC to suppress counterfeit currency in 1867 Secret Service responsibilities were broadened to include detecting persons perpetrating frauds against the government this appropriation resulted in investigations into the Ku Klux Klan non-conforming distillers smugglers mail robbers land frauds no number of other infractions against the federal laws so the jurisdiction for the Secret Service regarding Bitcoin is questionable but uh, we'll just have to wait and see how that shakes out I wanted to remind you of the sign that's on Ron Paul's desk and that is don't steal the government hates competition <laughs> so uh, apparently the rise in the Bitcoin has gotten the government very concerned in my opinion it has nothing to do with crime there's plenty of crime going on out there and there's a plenty of government agents out there to enforce the laws against crime my suggestion would be that rather than paying attention to the Bitcoin maybe some of these government agents should spend their time arresting criminals again I covered the fact that the DOJ is boasting that its largest money laundering bust was the six billion dollar bust I believe it was Liberty Reserve so again the question remains if money laundering is a 1.6 trillion dollar business then where are the prosecution against the banks and of course we know the answer don't steal the government hates competition so back to the Bitcoin it is uh, in a very very volatile phase right now we've seen these phases before of course when you go out to a very very long view those things don't show up uh, the 1 to 30 is barely even visible now that's all the way back here it was actually very volatile at that time uh, this spike if we look in terms of past history this spike isn't quite as large but it's starting to appear to be a candlestick that may have a top potential we'll just have to wait and see we haven't seen the volume we're now seeing buying volume coming in again I pointed out in the past if we go by the rule of tens that the Bitcoin has followed very closely not perfectly but very closely to 3 to 30 to 300 then potentially the target top here is going to be 3000 
we're at a parabolic move right now so if we do run to 3000 it's probably only going to be a matter of days otherwise we're probably going to get a crash out of this parabolic move a correction back down to the last top 260 or perhaps even in the hundreds and then we're off to the races for the next run and we'll talk to you next time